Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends. A warm welcome to all of you from your Pastor Yeti. On earth as it is in heaven. For today this discipleship one lead us not into temptation. We have reached the last of the three requests that relate to our needs as believers. The request for bread deals with our present needs and the request for forgiveness with our past sins. Now, we have before us the request for guidance and protection, which involves our future activities. When we pray, lead us, we are submitting ourselves to Jesus Christ as his disciples. For a disciple is a follower. Come, follow me, said Jesus to Peter and Andrew. And I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. At once they became disciples. The crisis of the call led to the process of learning and living that is discipleship. Peter and Andrew didn't ask how many hours they would serve each day or what the fringe benefits were, nor did they ask for a contract. They simply obeyed until that day. They had been their own bosses, but now Jesus would be given the orders. The first duty of every soul is not to find its freedom, but its master. When Jesus is our master, we are in him the, the freedom we need to live, serve, and grow. We are free to experience all that will make us what we were born to become. You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, a rock. The prayer begins with our Father and climaxes with Jesus, our Master. Our relationship is one of love, so there's nothing to fear. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my way. True discipleship involves giving all that we are and have for all of our lives so that we can receive all that God has planned for us. And perhaps the best modern equivalent of disciple would be apprentice, for apprentices love their work and their mentor, and they learn by listening, watching, and obeying. Jesus taught the disciples God's truth. They watched him as he ministered to various kinds of people in different circumstances. And then he sent them out to serve and find out for themselves how much they had really learned. The word translated temptation in Matthew 6, 13 can also mean trial or testing. James 1, 13 makes it clear that God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. James opened his letter by exhorting his readers, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Blessed are those who persevere under trial, because when they have stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who live Him, to love Him. The Father never tempts His children to evil. However, He does test our faith, because a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Faith is only as good as the project, I mean, as the object of that faith. And our faith is in the one true and living God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Whenever anyone makes a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, they will soon enter a time of trial and testing so that can learn whether or not their faith is real. In the parable of the sawyer, Jesus pointed out that there are people who hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But the soil of their hearts is shallow and their faith has no roots, and therefore their response is emotional and temporary. But when the sun come up, 
came up, the plants were scorched and they withered. And I mean, they withered because they had no root. Sunshine is good for plant life only if the plants have roots. Trials bring, bring blessings to true Christians, but not to shallow prof professors. God's true children benefit from trials. They have their roots in God's word, and trials only deepen those roots. Paul and Barnabas said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus told his disciples, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The Bible gives us many examples of true believers who didn't persevere under testing and instead gave birth to sin because they failed to trust God. Let's begin with Abraham, Genesis 12. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Stephen reminded the Jewish Sanhedrin, and when that happened, Abraham abandoned his idols, trusted the true God, and started off for the land God promised him. When he arrived there, he discovered a famine in the land. Surely the Lord wouldn't send his child in a famine. Instead of building an altar and waiting for God's direction, Abraham escaped to the land of Egypt where he almost lost his wife. Instead of trusting God, he lied about his wife and lost his testimony before a pagan, ruler and his court. This is a lesson all believers must learn. Faith is living without scheming. Abraham sinned because he turned a trial into a temptation. Moses, instead of turning to God by faith at, and praising him, they stood frightened at the Red Sea because Pharaoh's army was coming up behind them. And then God opened the sea and they passed through. When they were hungry, they wept and said, If only we had died at the Lord's hand in Egypt. For the next thirty-eight years, God sent them manna to eat. And when they were thirsty, they argued with Moses who cried out to God and then brought water out of the rock. The people as a whole resisted the authority God had given to Moses, and once even his own brother and sister opposed him. Why did the Lord permit these times of difficulty? Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 8, God was testing the Israelites and revealed their own sinfulness to them. He was encouraging them to trust him and not be afraid. These times of testing could have been a means of grace and blessing that would have increased their faith and their love for God. But their hearts were full of unbelief and their constant prayer was, How can we get out of this? instead of, What can we get, what can we get out of this? They wanted to go back to Egypt and settle for slavery instead of following God's leading, growing in grace, and inheriting their land. And moving into the New Testament, we see the disciples in a boat on the Sea of Galilee during a storm. But Jesus is not with them. At dawn, Jesus shows up, walking on the water, and the disciples are terrified. They had already seen him calm and calm a storm, and he had just fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. But the disciples' faith was still small. Peter had faith enough to get out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus, but then he was distracted by the dangerous circumstances around him, turned and tested into a temptation, and began to sink. Let's move to Acts 12 and look at a contrasting experience in Peter's life. He has been arrested and put into jail and in, is guarded by 16 Roman soldiers. The next time he is to be killed, what does Peter do? He goes to sleep. He was in such a deep sleep that the angel had to strike Peter on the side to wake him up. Imagine having an angel for an alarm clock. Why was Peter so calm? Because he knew Herod could never kill him. 
Jesus had already told Peter he would die by crucifixion in his old age. Peter's faith was tested, and this time he passed the test. He didn't doubt God's promises and turn the trial into a temptation. The key, of course, is faith. If, as Jesus' disciples, we follow him and do his will, he promises to take care of us. If we respond by complaining and scheming, how can I get out of this? We turn the trial into a temptation, and our unbelief limits what the Lord can do. How many times has the Lord said to us, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Faith means obeying God's will, <clears throat> no matter how we feel, no matter what the circumstances are around us, <clears throat> Excuse me, and no matter what consequences lie before us. To walk by sight instead of by faith means looking within, looking around, and looking ahead, and being afraid. Throughout Scripture, this one fact stands out. Every believer who was used of God was tested, and they trusted God and did not turn the trials to temptations. To the glory of God, they did the impossible. So when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're saving the Lord. Give me the faith. We're saying to the Lord, I mean, give me the faith. I need to accept this trial and use it for your glory. Deepen my roots, increase my faith, and help me turn this testing into triumph and not temptation. And then we rest on his word, because that is the source and strength of our faith. It isn't a sin to be tempted or to be tested, but it is a sin to complain and scheme instead of asking the Father for faith to overcome. Lead us not into temptation means, as we, your disciples, follow you, may we respond in such a way that we not turn opportunities of testing and growth into tragedies of temptation and defeat. God knows how much we can take and therefore how long our trials should last. Peter makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, Paul, I mean. No temptation, testing has overtaken you except what is common to us all. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted, tested because, because, beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Our trials may distress us, but there is always cause for rejoicing. While we are human and we feel pain, God can enable us to rise above pain and perplexity and to rejoice in Him and all that we have in Christ. It is a greater thing to pray for pain's conversion than for pain's removal. Paul pleaded three times that God would remove his painful torn in the flesh, but instead God converted the pain into power and transformed Paul's weakness into strength. What a conversion experience that is. For us to abandon faith and turn life trials into temptations means not only that we tempt ourselves, but also that we tempt the Lord's people and perhaps even the Lord. Defeated Christians waste their opportunities for growing in grace, glorifying God, and bearing witness to Jesus Christ and the gospel. Instead of being stepping stones and bringing people closer to Jesus, they become stumbling blocks that cause others to fall. To tempt God means to behave in such a self-centered and arrogant way that we are daring the Lord to stop us. It means deliberately disobeying him so that he must intervene in some way to keep us from harming ourselves and others and getting in the way of what he wants to do. How will Jesus characterize our lives when he reviews them at his judgment and seat? Well, he sees them as years of testing and rebellion, or years when he smiled upon us and was pleased with us. 
The Father wants to lead us, but how does He do it? Primarily, He leads us from the inspired Word of God, as we are taught by the Holy Spirit in fellowship with His people. Remember that the key pronoun in this prayer is us and not me. And throughout the century, the Spirit has given teachers to the Church and the written records of their experiences and their expositions of Scripture as a treasure of truth for those who will mind them. This doesn't mean that what they wrote is equal to the Scriptures in accuracy and authority, but only that we can learn from others as we follow the Lord. We need each other as we walk life's path. I'm grateful to the Lord for Christians who introduced me to some of the deep roots early in my Christian life. This includes so many great brothers and sisters loving the Lord as deep as they were rooted in the life that they shared and given by Christ. I learned a lot from very great and humble Christian authors like Andrew Murray, um, C.S. Lewis, Spurgeon, George Muller, Taylor, and so many others. It is a great, great blessing and of course open yourself to the empowering of the Holy Spirit in your life. Please notice why we obey God and walk in the deep roots and not on the enticing new detours. It is for His name's sake. God is glorified when we immerse ourselves in His Word and love it, learn from it, and obey it. He is glorified when we become acquainted with the spiritual leaders He blessed and used in the past, people who have walked in the, these roots and have so much to teach us, like in Augustine. Wesley, Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, Amy Carmichael, Oswald Chambers, and like I said, Andrew Murray, and George Muller, Hudson Taylor, so many more. We will not turn trials and testing into temptation if we stay in the right ruts. And the Holy Spirit of God is with us to help us. The bread of life comes sweeping through me, through us, and revive your church with life and power. Bread of life come, cleanse, renew us, and fit your church to meet this hour. Wind of God come, bend us, and break us. Revive, restore our lives. The bread of love, come, breed within us. Renew thoughts and will and heart. Come, love of Christ, refresh us to win us. Revive the church in every part. The heart of Christ, once broken for us, is there we find our strength and rest. And it is there we find our strength. Reverse, Lord, revive us. Equip your church to spread the light. In Jesus' name. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Eddie. Bye.